This is Drumwise Meets. Today, I'm here with world-class player and educator, Dom Famularo. Hi, Dom. How you doing? What age did you start drumming? And what bands inspired you? Boy, Tom, I probably have a very, very similar um, response to that, like many people do. I, am, uh, I was born in 1953, so I'm 66 years young. And at the time when I was uh, in 1964, when the Beatles hit the scene of America, it was that February 9th of 1964 that I sat in front of the television. And when I saw the Beatles on, on TV, it was they literally reached out and pulled you in to want to be involved with music. It was clearly I was you know, probably I started playing drums for about a, a year after that. And then about 12 years old. I became a professional and started working with bands. I had a pretty good groove and it began from there. So uh, it's, it was clearly the Beatles that, that sparked me involved with this entire journey. Cool. And can you remember what your first drum kit was? I do believe it or not. My first drum kit, my father was a fireman in a volunteer fireman in the local fire department and they had stopped their um, drum and bugle corps. So there were a bunch of equipment that was there that they want to get rid of. So when I said I wanted to learn to play drums. My dad kind of grabbed some stuff from there. So there was a 26 inch bass drum that was 12 inches thin. It was a marching bass drum. And that was my first bass drum. And then we had I found a little, you know, kind of an old antique bass drum pedal that we attached to it. And then I had a marching tenor drum that was white with blue dots on it. And we built a little stand that I could mount on that for a floor tom. I had a marching snare drum. And I had, believe it or not, a, and I still have this, it's a small 14 inch timpani. It's a 14 inch timpani with a copper base. You step on a pedal and that became one of my second floor toms. So you, you could hit the pedal and tune the drum. And I still have that. Actually, I have a dear friend of mine that's remodeling it for me and, uh, and getting it back in shape. And uh, that was my first drum kit. It was really kind of kind of clunky. The hi-hats were two marching cymbals that we put on a stand. So the sound of the drums was absolutely, you know, you know, you know, uncontrollable. The bass drum, the size of the bass drum and a marching snare drum and a tenor drum as a floor tom and a little timpani as a, it was such a unique sound of what it was in the cymbals. And that was my first kit. And believe it or not, I worked several gigs doing that with that kit. So it, it kind of made it work. And we were playing Beatles songs and we'd play and it kind of worked. And then when I made enough money, I went and I bought a ride cymbal that really had an incredible tone, beautiful sounding cymbal. And I slowly piece by piece as I worked, began to use that money to increase my kit until I could afford to buy a brand new Slingerland kit, a red sparkle Slingerland kit that was fantastic. You've done uh, so many things in your career. Is there, a, is there a highlight that stands out so far for you? Well, great question, Tom. You know, the, the, um, well, I've been playing professionally for 54 years and I have done clinics around the world uh, with some of the greatest drummers in the world, the Steve Gads, the Vinnie Kaliutas, the Dave Weckles, the Steve Smith, the Billy Cobhams. The, I, I've been on stage with wonderful, great, great legends and they have become wonderful friends of mine. I've done gigs that I played with Lionel Hampton and B.B. King and so many great big band and blues and, 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 and wonderful, you know, Barney Kessel, a great jazz player. I've had great gigs. I've done some great jingles in the 70s and early 80s in, the New, in New York City area where we were doing, you know, TV and, and radio commercials. So that was an intense business. And then just, you know, being an educator, you know, for a major part of my life, teaching has been exciting. But I think if, if, one, if one event was to stand out, my middle son, Jonathan, was, was taking some lessons from me and being prepared to play. He was playing drums in school. My oldest son played trumpet. My youngest son played saxophone. But my middle son, Jonathan, wanted to play drums. And so teaching him drums and preparing him for the music to play drum set was really a fun adventure in seeing him totally trust me for what I was guiding him on to play this concert. So when I prepared him for the concert, the band director said, listen, Mr. Family, it would be great if we could have two drums where you play with your son. 
So I played with my son at this event in front of our local school that had people excited. My son played, I played, we played together, playing with the elementary school band. And to me, that was the greatest event because the look on my son's face and my family in the audience and the local community and how they just made him feel and lifted him up that was it's probably one of the greatest gigs i've ever done and even though i played with some of the best on some of the best stages that one really stands out <laughs> that's so that's really nice i really like that and actually that reminds me of a, a similar I'll, I'll tell you of a little thing that happened here recently so my little boy's two and a half beautiful um you know so obviously he's, he's very little to be playing but he's there's this there's this song that we've always played him you know ever since he was just a bump um, <laughs> in this song and it's magic because you know he'd be having a big screaming thing when he was little and you put the song on and it would calm him down so i mean i, I really think music is just a magic thing but he, he came in here with my wife and she, she said oh do you want daddy to play you your song on the drums and he went yeah and <laughs> so I, I played it through sat here and he stood over there and his face i've never seen it he was just just like just in a trance just watching me and like and then it finished and he was just like wow and it's, <laughs> it's magical and it, it's I, yeah you can't you can't make that up can you it's, that, that is beautiful and you know that is something which he will remember the magic and connection that music has to people the relationship that we have with music is so deep i mean i have played some great music some funk rock jazz latin i've done so much types of music but when I go back and hear an early Beatles song, it brings me right back to the beginning stage of what inspired me to want to play drums and music and get involved in this crazy business. Yeah, pretty powerful. When you first get a gig with a, with a new artist, how do you learn the material? So do you just listen to, to the material? Do you listen to it and then transcribe it? Or are you sent a whole pack of loads of drum music? Here you go, Dom, here's the entire show written out on 55 pages. You know, yeah. how, how does it kind of work for you? Well, that's a, that's a great question. The answer really is all of the above. It depends on the situation of what, what it needs. If it's, a, if it's a simpler band where we're playing kind of pop music, I, 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 my first st stage is always to listen to the music first. Before I write anything down, I listen first. Because if I listen first, I then trust my instinct of what's going to, what I'm attracted to. And if there's a part that's confusing, then I know I may have to focus on that. But I try and take it in to absorb the, the uh, emotional content that it is displaying. And if I have the right empathy and compassion to take it in. So that's the first part of it, to take it in. Then if I feel boy, this one section is difficult, then I'll transcribe that one section. I may make a, a full chart for it, but I might make the, the, the other parts of the chart kind of a, a shorthand, but that one section I might write out completely. If the music is extremely complicated from the beginning to the end, then I have to listen to it and then I really have to chart everything out. And if it's that complicated, I then ask, do you have a drum part? If they have a drum part, I'll take the drum part and analyze it from there. There was a, a percussion section that was um, that invited me to a, to a um, percussion show in Florida many years ago. And they had a piece of music, a percussion piece that was written that was, they hit, was it's like 10 pages and it was complicated. It had different lines in there. It had different accents. It had different grooves. It had different time signatures. It was an amazing, when I looked at it, I said, oh my gosh. Then I had them play the music for me. And when I heard the music part of it, it wasn't as difficult. So that what I was reading on the paper, if I went there first, I would have scared the heck out of myself. But because I trusted again listening, that opened it up and then that made the reading much easier that there were certain sections that looked difficult, but if I just listened, I could get through it correctly. So there's a really balance of how we have to do it. So I always say to everybody, try and learn the skills that best you can as a musician, the techniques, the reading, the different styles, the musical emotion of it, learn all of that. And then when you hear a piece of music, trust the tools that you have to deliver you to how to be able to get to perform that. Awesome. Yeah, great answer. <laughs> I think sometimes students don't realize 
what it you know what it's actually like because when they come here often they want to learn a song so we transcribe it for them but but obviously in the real world they kind of have to get used to transcribing their own stuff so absolutely have you ever had anything uh, go wrong on stage that you've had to recover from that you can tell us about <laughs> I don't know where to begin. There have been many of them, believe it or not, Tom. There have been situations where I've gone on and we did a sound check and I get to stage and for whatever reason, my monitor's not working. First tune, they count it off, we hit it and I've got nothing I can hear, you know? And all I can hear is kind of like the guitar player who's standing near me. I kind of hear his strumming from his electric guitar, but I can't hear his amp. I hear nothing. And at that point, you then have to trust, you have to trust your, your, your musical experience to deliver you to a place where you can ask for the help, but you don't want to be screaming on stage that your monitor's out. You want to try and point to the monitor while you're playing, while you're trying to hold it all together. So you learn how to kind of like, you know, I, I guess to a certain degree, it would, it would be like being blind or being deaf. You have to kind of feel it to see exactly what exactly is going on. So that has happened. I have had certain performances where everything was set and a stand broke. And I'm, and I'm playing and all of a sudden that symbol is gone. And, you know, and that's a, a major part of how I would play. So now you, you adapt. So I say to adapt means that when something goes wrong, it's nothing bad about it. I never look at it negatively. I look at it as I am being tested can I overcome this challenge so the listener in the audience has no idea what's going on? That's what professionalism is. You know, if I go to a, to a, a doctor and I'm laying on, on the, the gurney and he's going to cut me open and, and have surgery on me, I don't want the doctor coming in saying, okay, I got to work on this patient. Oh man, I'm divorcing my wife, man. What a pain. And I'm going through this whole lawyer thing. Boy, my life is in a mess. Okay, who's the first patient? I don't want that doctor to cut me open. A professional will come in and no matter what his challenges are, he'll come in and he'll act like a professional and want to know exactly what's right for the patient. So to me, I always think when I go on that stage, it's totally not about me. It's about what this team of musicians on stage can do to produce the people in the audience, the greatest emotional musical experience. I think that's got to be the common, the common ground. And with that, whatever challenge came up, I just kind of went with the flow and dealt with it and kept on playing. And, and, and we always seem to get through it. It really is. Mm, that's it. And just, you know, the show must go on. <laughs> Keep playing. Exactly right. Exactly. What made you start teaching and why did you start teaching? But also a great question, Tom. This was, I, I would have been very fortunate. I live... On, in, on Long Island. And Long Island is about, you know, I lived about 20 minutes outside of New York City. Now I live about one hour outside of New York City. So in one hour, I have the, the blessing of being in New York City, which is just an incredibly energized, artistic city. And one hour later, I can be back home. So I have the best kind of a both worlds. Where I live is kind of like there's a, a forest behind my house that I'm able to enjoy the, the wonderful, you know, garden and greenery of where I live. And then in one hour I could be in the center of New York City. I think what's amazing about it is that because of living where I lived, I was always around great musicians who were great teachers and very inspirational people. They were into what they did. I had the chance of meeting at 18 years old, Buddy Rich. And when I met Buddy Rich, my teacher, Al Miller, who was another inspirational person, introduced me to Buddy Rich. He and Buddy Rich were in the Marines together in World War II and they were both martial arts instructors, of course, and both being drummers. So they hit it off. So whenever Buddy would come in town, he would call up his Marine friend, Al Miller, and Al would contact me. I was one of his best students, and we'd go to the gig together. So I'd hear Buddy. So I met Buddy. And meeting Buddy, he was just such a, a loving guy. He was fun. He was into drumming. All the, the negative stories you hear about Buddy, I have to laugh at because he was just so into drumming and so friendly that I, I witnessed that. And then I met Max Roach, and Max Roach was another loving, you know, sharing professor of the art form. And then having met Louis Belson, and then Joe Morello, another great player, great, great educator, Jim Chapin, Shelley Mann. These guys were just 
they were legends, but they were regular people that just loved what they did so much and their passion, they wore it on their, on their sleeve. It was so obvious that they were passionate about what they did. So every day was about learning and growing. And then they would share this. So that's what I was around. So I, I couldn't help but be involved with this. So at 17 years old, I started teaching professionally because I was play, playing certain gigs and young drummers would come up and say, hey, could you show me that? So they kept on asking me. So eventually I organized some teaching, started teaching at a local music store, started making some good money teaching. So I would teach during the day, then go to a rehearsal and then go to a gig. So my life was always about teaching was a part of it. So that now I'm going on, I'm going on, my gosh, I'm going on what's going to be almost 50 years of teaching pretty soon. You know, so, I mean, it's pretty amazing that I've, I've always done it. I've never advertised, but I have over 2,500 students that travel to me from over 30 countries. And now because of the internet, which I have been teaching for the past 20 some odd years on the internet, this changeover now about using all these different programs is I've been doing that for many, many years. And um, so now I've got students, my God, like I said, just last week alone, I taught students in eight countries just last week. That's not including my private lessons. Those were just master classes. My private lessons, I probably have to add up, add another 10 countries. I've got students in China, in Japan, in, in the UK, in Germany, in France, in Italy, in Spain, in Brazil, throughout Canada. So all these countries, you know, Belgium, I had a student, Norway, I've got a student in Oslo. So when I think about what happens in a month of my time, I travel around the world several times teaching and it really is, it's, it's, it's humbling. And I think of my great masters that taught me and they're all gone now. So the responsibility is people like myself and yourself to carry on this, this tradition. What sort of person do you think it takes to be a good drum teacher? I mean, you kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier because um, I believe that um, a, a good drummer doesn't necessarily make a good drum teacher. Mm -hmm. I think they're two very different things. Um, what's your opinion on that? Well, it, it's interesting. I, I know some drummers who are phenomenal drummers, but they don't really understand what they do. They just do it. And, uh, you know, Tony Williams was like this. He was, he was, you know, was so great at how he played and he didn't always know how to answer what he did. So there are some, you know, artists that are, are just are, are so great at playing that the educational side kind of came differently to them. I was very fortunate because of where I lived, there were all these great drummers around me. So I started studying with all of them. I went and took lessons with everyone that I could. And each lesson was, you know, Papa Joe Jones. I took a couple of lessons with Papa Joe Jones. This was, this was a, a philosophy lesson. I had one lesson with Elvin Jones with the entire hour. He just played for me. So he wasn't necessarily a great teacher, but he played ride cymbal and snare and bass drum for one hour. He had me sit next to his hi-hat and he played. And in him playing and me watching and feeling him play, I was able to learn an amazing amount from that lesson. So a part of it is the relationship of how the teacher will deliver it and how the student is willing to accept it and take it in. So what the teacher has to have is has to have an incredible amount of compassion to feel what the other person feels. That's what compassion means to know what that person needs and then how they learn so I can deliver that so they can understand it. So when they leave that lesson, they leave a step higher than when they came in. So to me, every lesson has to have that. Patience, patience is such an important part. And you know, I've got three boys that are now in their, in their, their 20s. And being a parent was really an incredible you know, learning experience for making me a better teacher. You know, it, it really was great. So, 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 you know, that was a, a big part of it. And, you know, I mean, just the, the idea that I am, I consider myself a constant learner. So I'm a constant student. So I think to be a good educator, you have to have that drive to constantly be open-minded. As Frank Zappa said, the mind is like a parachute. It only works when it's open. With that, if I apply that to drumming, new ideas are going to be coming in. On my desk here, I've got 25 drum books that have been mailed to me in my studio. I've got probably a thousand drum books that are there easily. 
And in my office here on my shelving, I've got another thousand books that I have here. So I'm constantly taking things in and constantly learning. And by constantly learning, I'm constantly growing. So a good educator has to have the desire to grow and change. I am teaching differently now than I was even a year ago. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one. What you, what you said about um, kids as well, because I very much like the whole patience thing. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very patient with my students. I always ha have been, but now that I've got my little boy, <laughs> I find that I use up my patience in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a tantrum about not wanting to wear socks. I'm just like, I can't, my brain can't cope with this. Just put your socks on. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I learned, which was, which was very helpful to me with my, and again, three boys and my boys are about 20 months apart. So they were all close in age. And it was always mayhem and craziness. And I learned something. If, if, my, if my son decided he didn't want to wear socks, I said, cool, don't wear socks. I didn't make the challenge that important. I made the fact that he made a choice. And that's what I respected was the choice. So it's the same thing with my students. I try to always show them a, a large amount of respect. If they want to learn something, I will assist them to learn that. If they want to learn it their way, then I have to say, okay, we have a choice. If I teach it to you your way, it's going to take us a year to learn that, that challenge. If you let me teach it to you my way, we can do it in two months. So you tell me how much money you want to spend to learn that. You can spend a year's worth of lessons or you can spend a few months worth of lessons. So I give them the choice. They always realize, well, I want to learn it faster. I said, great, then let me show you my way from my experience and we'll get to where you want to go a lot quicker. Mm. So I think the rationality of how we teach has got to be a, 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 a point of compassion and a point of, of real, really, you know, I, I want the students to really learn, but I want them to also have fun. Mm. I want this to be fun. And with my boys, the same thing. I wanted my boys to grow up and be good kids, but I wanted to have fun with them. I don't, I always say, I, I, I'm working on a book now called Owning Now. It's my, my second motivational book, and I'm working on the book. And it's about owning the moment. And we only own this moment. Yesterday is gone, and I do not own tomorrow. I don't even own later. So I have to realize that if I only own this moment, I want to make sure this moment is the best moment I can make as I am with you now, Tom. I want to make this moment the best moment I can so when I leave this interview and I go on to my next moment, I can stay focused and put all my energy on that next moment. So it's really about, to me, giving each student 100% of their attention, of my attention, and together, we're going to go someplace that probably individually we would have not gone. What are your hobbies away from drumming? Wow, hobbies away from drumming. Um, I like writing. I like writing. So, so I'm, I'm working on, aside from working on several drum books, I've got many drum books out now, but I've got some more that I'm working on. But I'm working on, on certain books. Um, this uh, motivational book that I'm working on, Owning Now, is kind of takes me away from, from drumming, but it's my musical experience that allows me to understand how to own now. I'm working on another book called The Business and Art of Art, which is the combination of business and art how we have to balance those two. I've got several ideas for some movies. My oldest son is a writer and I meet with him once a week and we discuss these ideas of these movie ideas. And it, it could be a movie, it could be a TV series, it could be a Netflix series. These ideas that are creative about ideas. And most of them are not about music. One of them is about my father's adventures in World War II. It was an, it was an extremely different story of what happened in World War II and because of that, um, I felt that he shared these stories with the last year he was alive. He stayed, I, I had him move in with, to, to my house and um, he never talked about his, his challenges or stories in World War II until the last year of his life. And part of it was because of his Alzheimer, his memory, he could remember things years ago better than he could remember what happened at breakfast. So he started discussing about what went on and I was just shocked to know what he went through. So I started to make notes. And then when he passed away, I, I sat down with my son and I said, you know, something's here. There's really, so we're working on that. So as a hobby, I'll focus on, on the, the script writing concept. I'll focus on writing with my book. 
And uh, of course, the ultimate hobby to me is spending time with my family. Whenever I get a chance to have my boys individually or collectively come home, the world stops mm -hmm. and I get involved with their lives. And that becomes the hobby of just truly what family is about. And again, owning now within that time that we have with our family. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Oh, good stuff. And I think also the hobbies thing again, we're quite lucky as, as drummers, I think, because for all of us, drums started out as a hobby. I think that's undeniable. You know, we all, you know, got a drum kit or made, made a drum kit and, and yeah. uh, loved it. And then it's like, oh, we're, we're, we're lucky enough that it's become our, our job and it, it pays the bills. And, you know, whether it's teaching or playing or recording or touring or whatever. So it's, it's quite an interesting one for us that we kind of, our hobby is kind of our job. Absolutely. This is, this is big time. I listen, I tell people, I haven't worked a day in my life. I play every day. I have fun playing, not only playing the drums, but playing in the music industry. It's fantastic joy. I mean, let's face it. I love fishing. I love boating. Those are all fun things to do, but nothing can replace the fact that every day when I wake up, I am living my passion. And when someone can understand what their passion is and then find a way to make a living out of that, I said to my three boys when they were going to university, I said, listen, I'm going to pay for everything in your university. I have saved even before you guys were born. I saved and I'm ready for it. And I'm, we're going to make this happen. And I'm going to pay for everything. I don't want you to have any expense. When you leave university, you will have no bills. I'm going to pay for your tuition. I'm going to pay for your room and board. I'm going to pay for your transportation. I'm doing everything. And I want you to really enjoy being at college. I said, but there's two things you have to do for me now in order for me to do that. Number one, you have to go to school for your passion. Whatever you are passionate about, that's what we're going to do. And if you tell me it's, it's knitting, then we're going to find the best knitting school and we're going to find out how you can make a great living knitting. So I don't, I, have, I don't care what your passion is. I just want you to be driven every day with your passion. I said, now that you're going to school for your passion, the second thing is you have to deliver me straight A's. I said, because if, if I'm paying your full way for you to go learn your passion and you deliver me a B or a C, I'm not convinced that's your passion. I'm pulling the financial plug. So I gave them the line, I want you to inspire the investor. Yeah. Inspire the investor. And that's what they did. They went to school for their passion. They all are doing what they love doing. And they all delivered me straight A's. Wow. So when they left college, they left college with a high degree. They all were able to get jobs when they came out of college. And they had zero expense bills when they left. Yeah. That to me is, is a, a great journey of what it's like to be able to understand passion. And what a lovely thing for you to have done as well. That's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> so lovely. Um, so what, um, if we can refer to it as an industry, um, yeah. what sort of person do you think you need to be to successfully work in the music industry? Well, great question. I, I, I think, I think there, there are qualities. I mean, the music industry, the industry uh, substantiates the business side of it. And the business side of it is the fact that's going to allow you to monetize, to make money from it, so you can then pay your bills. You know, in the early days when I was, when I was uh, auditioning for people like B.B. King and playing with them, and then they offered me to go on the road. And um, when they offered me the money of what it would take, it was a lot less money than what I was making living in the New York area. So it was, and it was a considerable, you know, cut in, in, in income. And I'd have to be on a bus and sharing a room with somebody. And, and so I, I kind of said, guys, why, why would I want to take that much of a cut to play with you? I mean, how will I even be able to afford paying my rent? And they said, yeah, but, but you'll be playing with B.B. King. I said, well, I get that. I said, so, so when my phone bill comes in and I can't pay for it, can I tell a phone company, hey, wait a second, I'm playing with B.B. King. Can you let that phone bill go? It doesn't work that way. So we have to really be conscious of the fact that we have to be able to fundamentally live, fundamentally live in this world. And that means we have to have an income coming in that we can pay bills to survive. Now, all I wanted to do was if I could just pay my bills to survive, 
that to me was success because I knew I was living my passion, my dream. If I could just pay my bills and exist, I was winning. If I was able to do any better than that, then I was way ahead of the game. So what does it take? It takes real great perseverance, which means quitting is, is not an option. It takes discipline, which is self-control. It takes incredible hard work to work and focus on developing my talent, which is the skill of being a drummer, and then develop the business skills of how to sell that whether I sell that to different bands as a performer, whether I sell it as an educator, or whether I sell it as an author of writing books, I've got to learn all those aspects. So the qualities are really about survival. If you want to survive, you will adapt to what is needed to become the success that you see in your future. Again, if the success is just to survive, I was successful. If the success is then go to the next level, and I wanted to have a global name. So I wanted to go out and do these events. So I hooked up with companies like Sabian, Mapex, and Remo, and Vader. These are companies that really kind of saw what I did and are assisting me in putting this bigger global picture together because they know I'm helping them out. So typical business skills are needed. So I recommend to many of my, my students, whether they're teachers or performers, read several business books. Read books about marketing, about sales, about branding. Understand what that means and just apply that to yourself in the industry. Having a website, domfamulara.com. I've got my website. It's got my name in it. Thank you very much. If anybody wants any information on me, I tell them, hey, great, domfamulara.com. Just go there and it's all there. So I had to put together these forces that would assist me to be able to survive by making an income in this crazy industry. Slight curveball question for you here, like the, the biggest curveball question. And we've had some really interesting answers on this one. So what's your favorite cookie? <laughs> My favorite cookie, but that's, that, that's I, the challenge is I have many favorite cookies. <laughs> so you give me a good old fashioned chocolate chip cookie and I'm there. And I'm there and I'm happy. But I also like macaroon nuts in the cookies. Oh. So if I have a cookie that has macaroon nuts, that's a whole nother level of, of intensity. And, you know, sometimes my wife will make a, a, a real nice, nice a cookie with icing on it, like black and white icing on it. And just that kind of icing on that cookie. So I've got a few different ways that I can go and I would be completely happy in any of those. <laughs> would you, um, I don't know if this is a more of a British thing, I don't know, but would you, would you dunk that cookie in you know, tea or coffee? Oh my gosh, the answer is absolutely yes. In the days that I drank coffee, now I haven't had coffee in about 25 years, I gave up coffee. And in those days of dipping that cookie in coffee or dipping it just in milk, Ooh. oh my gosh, this was like, this was my reward. Many times when I come back from gigs late at night, when I was living home with my parents, my mom would make some chocolate chip cookies and there was always fresh milk there. And to me, I'd come back from this gig, I'd be playing, I made some money, I'd come back into our little kitchen, open up, see those cookies, take out some milk, I'd put some music on to wind down from the gig and I would just be in heaven. So those little rewards are pretty memorable. <laughs> there we go. You heard it here, dip your cookie in milk. <laughs> <laughs> so back, back to a serious one. This is my, my last question for you. So um, obviously as, as educators, we're always giving advice to, uh, to students, but if you could just give one bit of advice to whether it's an up and coming drummer or a drummer that's just, you know, that's just still learning, which is well, it's all of us, I suppose. But um, if you could give one bit of advice to drummers, what would that be? Learn to have fun. If you, if you learn to have fun, then every moment that you're playing the instrument becomes really enjoyable. So it's learn to have fun, but equally it's have fun while you're learning. If learning can be fun, then I can take information in because I know as that information comes in, I'm getting better. If I'm getting better, 
I'm seeking a higher level of enjoyment by having better skills that not only does it make me happy, but then it brings joy to others when they hear me play. So I always say, you know, have fun while you're learning and then learn to have fun. Balance those two in a way that it really kind of sets a, a cycle inside of you that perpetuates education. And the more you grow, this, the, the bigger the fun gets. <laughs> That's great. Someone said in one of these interviews recently about uh, sometimes students get focused on, on the end goal too much and they don't enjoy the, the, the learning journey. Yeah. That end goal. And I, I find with some students that's so true. They, they get so frustrated because they've got this, this goal in mind. But I really feel that we need to enjoy all that playing and learning that we do up until that point. And obviously that point is never the end because, um, you know, I've had students before that have, their parents have said, right, little Jimmy's um, going to stop lessons now because he, he's learned everything. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I've been playing for, you know, for 20 years, which is, you know, not, not that long in the great scheme of things. But, but you know, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it really is. But it also goes back to, to owning the moment. You know, the journey is, you listen, the goal and where you want to be, that's great. And, and, and yes, that will always change. But to own the moment while you're learning, if I can take this page out of that book and really take control over it and have fun with it and really step into that world, that's getting me closer to, the, to that journey. But it's really allowing me to enjoy the moment more. So it's kind of a combination of both. You want to stay focused on where you want to be, but you really kind of have to take in the excitement and the fact that every time you learn something, you change. You know, I always say it's kind of like accepting a challenge. You know, in my book, my cycle of self-empowerment book, I mentioned that inside the word challenge is the word change. So once I accept the word challenge, I have to now accept change. I have to adapt differently. And that's what education does. Education comes into me and I learn something that I didn't have before. I become a different person than when before I knew that. So if I can keep every day taking in some new ideas, this to me is the journey of life that just is exciting and, and more exciting every day. So Dom, thank you so much for spending your time with us here at Drumwise today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Tom. Drumwise.co.uk. I'm going to go check it out and I want to be involved with this. Drumwise meets Bring It On. <laughs>